So technically, I'm in the middle of a series. This is part three on the revival of a nation. And this is an unusual direction or thought that I'm injecting into this series that is very timely, I think even for me as a, as a man. Uh, there's a lot of unique challenge that I am facing, not the typical challenge. It's not like false accusation is coming against me. It's not like we're out of money in the bank. You know, the ones that I'm used to. <laughs> this is different. This is an unusual angle, and I, I'm actually enjoying it in a strange way. I'm enjoying the tensions of soul because I feel like God is very near and very present and helping me walk through it. And I cherish that. I really do. I sense that God has a great purpose in and through this current challenge in our country. I'm giving this on January 10th, 2021. I do not know the events that are just around the corner, but someone could listen to this in the next couple months and wonder why there w we even called it tension, because all the tension could actually be released through some magnificent event that takes place, right? But right now, every one of us in this room could testify of a very real tension that we're all feeling in different levels, but it's not a personal tension. And yet it is, it's a, but what's different about it is it's a corporate tension. We're all sharing it, and that's unusual for me. Growing up in the church and then starting into ministry, I've had a lot of individual or personal challenge or trials or conflicts that I've walked through. Meanwhile, a whole bunch of people around me could have it easy and be thriving and be like, oh, and God came through for me here. Oh, God answered this prayer, and meanwhile, my prayer hasn't been answered for months, right? Or, you know, I'm out of money and this person just came, you know, just won the lottery. It feels like that at times, where it's an isolated challenge and everyone else is sort of fine. And it, that's a challenge in and of itself. To have an isolated personal challenge while everyone else seems to be thriving is a unique tension of soul. This is different. It's not a, Eric's personal bank account or Eric's personal reputation. It's like the reputation of the church. It's the we're all sort of rallying around one thing, and that is, God, we need you. And it's like all our prayers are starting to aim in the same direction. This is, this is great. We've been asking for unity in the body of Christ for a long time. And technically, we find this right now. Now, some people are misdirected in their praying specifically just towards, like, for instance, the president and the presidency. And I'm not saying that doesn't matter in this. I'm saying God is frying bigger fish than that, though. In other words, if we were to look at a presidency as a saving element instead of as God as the saving element, we're actually misdirected as the church. And so oftentimes God will allow things to come to the level of impossibility where no human arm can save so that he will get the credit for the salvation. We need to remember that in a time like this, that whenever something comes to the place of impossibility, we enter the God zone. So this one's called The Sleeping Savior, and for those of you that are familiar with the stories of Scripture, you might be able to hazard a guess of uh, what this is because there was one event in history where Jesus fell asleep. It's such an odd thing because we don't see Jesus sleeping throughout the, the New Testament. We're presuming he slept like a normal man, right? But we don't see it. We're not seeing this, uh, his sleep habits, but what a strange time to fall asleep. This story, which is in three different gospel accounts, is quite magnificent, and it's very important, I believe, for understanding revival, but also just for understanding how we as individual Christians and a corporate body appropriate times of peril, times of jeopardy is the word that the, that the gospel of Luke is going to use to describe the disciples' situation. They were in a state of jeopardy, peril, extreme danger. Their lives were actually at risk, where if something doesn't intervene, they are dead men. And in the midst of this, ironically, Jesus is sleeping. Psalm 121. I want you to just freshly allow your soul to be cheered. You can go to any news network right now and you're not going to hear this. And that is because the news is covering what is happening and what is happening doesn't look very good. Ironically, 
the news never covers what the Spirit of God is doing. Like the Spirit of God is cheering my soul this morning. That didn't make it into the news. Could you imagine? Eric Ludi's soul was cheered this morning. No one cares, right? And yet that's still something that is happening in this earth that is supernatural. Because how could it be so dark and so dismal out and Eric is cheerful and singing a song this morning? That's supernatural. That's amazing. That should be news. <laughs> but it would be very boring news for most people. So as a result, you know, the news networks aren't going to make any money if that's all they're covering. Uh, but it's still true. And it's still news and it's still reality. The Spirit of God is doing something right now in us. He is alive and kicking. And let's remember that. Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Isn't that an ironic statement uh, when I have a title for our message called The Sleeping Savior? He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Now imagine that some high-level, high-ranking military officer comes to you and says, I have a message from General Milley, who's the chief of staff, the highest-ranking military officer in the United States, and he has a direct message for you, and he wants to tell you that the, doesn't matter what happens in the world, the United States military has decided that they want to preserve you. And they read something like this to you. In other words, the U.S. military is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The U.S. military shall preserve you from all evil. They shall preserve your soul. The U.S. military shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. You know, you'd be heartened by that, wouldn't you, to know that someone is looking out for you? And yet, this is a statement so much more grand than the most mighty military on earth personally attending to your life, your calling, and your direction. The key is in the time of difficulty, you must hearken back to this and not forsake this. You see, faith is grounded in something. It's called the Word of God, the rock. We fix ourselves to it so that in a time of trial, in a time of difficulty, we recall the promise. And then in the midst of the trial, we can smile because we know that God is in control, and that is faith. When you forget the promise in the midst of the trial, that is not faith. When you begin to panic and give way to the natural elements around you and deem them as more powerful than God's calling and purpose for you, then it leads to discouragement, frustration, fear, despair, all the things that are the result of removing God from the story. You remove God from the story and you have all sorts of nonsense. Some of us have felt that. You know, as we're dealing with the nonsense around us, because I struggle to find a better term for it, it's, it's nonsensical in so many regards. It's like, if I believe this, I could almost predict that the next thing that's going to happen in this culture would be something that totally contradicts what I believe, Right? And my, my grandpa had that same method for reasoning. He said, uh, you, know, I, you want to know how I vote? I find what Ted Kennedy votes, and I vote the opposite. <laughs> and in a sense, you could almost feel that same thing happening. It's like, if I believe this as a Bible-believing Christian, I guarantee you they're going to do the opposite and call that wrong. Because what I believe is wrong in an ever-growing sense to this world that is building up this political correctness that is anti-Christ. That's what it is. It is anti-Christ. So if you're anti-Christ, it shouldn't surprise us that it's opposite of what we are holding to because we love Christ. We're pro-Christ. That's what we are. So we're, we're, there's a tension at work. Faith is built on believing. Believing in this word, the word in text, 
the word in person, Jesus Christ, and what that person, Jesus Christ, the word of God made flesh, did on that cross. He has won the victory. Do we remember that in the darkest hour? That our king sits enthroned on high and all things are beneath his feet. That's reality. The news doesn't oftentimes think to cover that. But if there was a gospel news source, if there was a heavenly news source, which there is, it's called the Holy Spirit, what's he reminding us of? What's his news break in the morning? If he could get your cell phone and have a news break, you know, pop up in an app and say, Eric, I just want to remind you I'm seated on high. All things are beneath my feet today. Go live large today for my glory. You see, we don't get that little blip on our app, or do we? You see, Christianity is built around the Holy Spirit bringing to remembrance the Word of God. We need a Psalm 121 remembrance, not just Psalm 121. We could say the whole of Scripture, but we need the ding in our soul. It says, hey, Ludi, get your eyes off the things of this earth and turn them heavenward. I am the God of the impossible. I am in control when the nations, the kings of this earth, they conspire against me, they're surrounding me with evil intent. You remember what I do? The one enthroned in heaven laughs and holds them in derision. So would you join me in all the fun? You see, we are not beneath the storm. As Christians, we rise above the storm. Yes, the storm is there, but we have a heavenly mindset towards it, so therefore, we are not drenched in it. Instead, we can delight in oh, the fact that the flowers are going to get more beautiful and the grass is going to be greener because of this. Psalm 121, 3 through 4. Sorry, the, the, there's not a colon after 121. It's sort of a weird-looking scripture. That it looks like a date. He who keeps you will not slumber. Promise. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. I think that's what's funny about this story. You know, there's all sorts of things I could also say. He will not forget you. And yet I could show you a story in Scripture that appears that Jesus forgot what Mary and Martha, what he told Mary and Martha. He told Mary and Martha that Lazarus' sickness would not end in death, and then he like disappears and Lazarus dies. What does that look like? It looks like God forgot. I could say that God will never be defeated, and yet I could show you a story in the scriptures that sure does appear that Jesus lost the battle. Look, he just died, guys. <laughs> I don't know what you call that. I could also tell you that God always hears, and yet there's a story in scripture where the Syrophoenician woman is begging him for help, and he is totally ignoring her, almost like he's deaf. You see, what can appear a certain way in the natural realm, we need to remember what is true. And even though it may appear that Jesus is asleep in your hour of peril, he is very much awake and alert to your needs. In the boat with Jesus, and it appears that he is, <clears throat> awkward shift in seat, sleeping. What? This is such a, it's a really, it's sort of a fun story too. You almost feel like the scriptures are sharing it as a fun story. <laughs> because it is so odd. Everything about it is odd, and yet I find it profoundly beautiful for right now for each of us. We're in a boat. How did we get in this boat, guys? Do you know how you were led into this boat? Guess who led you there? Spirit of God has led you to this day. Most of us in this room are not just God-fearing, we're serious about our Christianity. And so the reason we are where we're at in life right now is because we are doing our best to be sensitive to the Spirit of God and to be right where he wants us. So where has he led us? He's led us right here. In this hour, in this time, in this circumstance, you know, in this story, you know who led them into that boat to cross that lake? It was Jesus. He was the one that led them into this. Matthew 8, so I'm going to read through three different accounts of this in Scripture, and the fact that it's recorded three different times from three different lenses is important, okay? Just one time, one reference of anything in Scripture matters to us, because if all, remember what it says at the end of the book of John, if all that Jesus did was written down, then you couldn't, you know, contain the books in this world. I mean, it's so massive, right? And yet, that means God, the Holy Spirit, is going to pick very specific stories to write down. So if it's written down once, that means God's highlighting it, saying, this matters to you. If it's written down three times, I mean, what's your conclusion on that? 
Okay, this is significant, guys. Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. That's what we're doing. <laughs> Jesus gets in the boat, we're like, uh, following him. I mean, they're fishermen, they're used to this, and most of them are fishermen, I should say. And they're, they're used to getting in boats, this is not foreign to them, and suddenly, uh-oh, a great tempest arose on the sea. This is a very, very strong wind. This isn't just a little gust. This is a squall, or like a tornadic sort of wind that is threatening their very life. Remember, a lot of these guys are very used to being on the water, and they're panicking. They're marked by fear. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? I want to repeat his question. Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? So, you got up this morning, and you went about your business. Some of you may have glanced at the news. Not always the best idea, by the way. You need to show a little restraint there. And I don't know if you were heartened and encouraged by all the wonderful things that you read, but imagine Jesus, as your boat is filling up with water and your life is in peril, if he says, uh, why are you fearful? Now, what's funny is we have plenty of reasons that we could give back to that. Excuse me, do you not understand what it's like to live in one of these bodies in hostile territory? These people are turning against us. I mean, I'm not used to difficulty. I'm used to having everything I need. I'm an American. I, 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 I'm, I'm used to something comfortable, and this is starting, starting to threaten that. There's reasons why we are fearful. Jesus doesn't seem to get it, does he? Why are you fearful, O oh, you of little faith? So Mark 4, 35 through 41, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. This is his idea, guys. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Does that sound like a quote, unquote, of the church right now? Uh, God, I know you're busy and you're doing all sorts of things in the heavenlies and you got other issues around the world, but this is a rather big issue that we're dealing with in this nation. There's a lot of junk that people are getting away with and there's serious deception going on. We have, you know, righteousness falling in the street. Truth, you know, is just crumbling before us. I'm are you asleep? <laughs> What's going on here? Don't you care that we're perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? All right, here we are at the Luke account, Luke 8, 22 through 25. Now it happened on a certain day that they got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. What do we know? So this is a basic overview. It's not really that in-depth. Jesus led them into this great storm. So that's one thing we know. Two, Jesus deliberately chose to lay down and go to sleep in the midst of this storm. Three, the disciples' lives were in jeopardy. Four, the disciples' response to this jeopardy was incorrect. So there's all sorts of factors in here that I sort of want to draw out because I would like us, when we enter into our jeopardy, when we enter into a time of peril, that we respond 
in agreement with what the Holy Spirit is writing this down to help us towards. God has a purpose to instruct us in righteousness, to instruct our souls so that we can learn from this, so that we can grow stronger from it. So let's do that. Mark 4, 40. He said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Isn't that a funny question? Why are you so fearful? Your boat is filling up with water. Isn't it obvious why I'm fearful? And yet one of the things you're going to note in the kingdom of heaven is there is actually zero circumstances in all of life that are deserving of fear inside of us as Christians. I just want you to chew on that for a second, that there is actually not one circumstance in all of life that should trigger something known as fear inside of us. All right, that would be nice, is the way most of us think. Yeah, that would be great, but come on. But that's actually what the Bible teaches, and this is a perfect illustration of it practically. Because we're looking at a situation which is dire, perilous, extremely dangerous. These guys are going to die, and Jesus is not doing anything. He's sleeping. I mean, for all practical purposes, if there was ever a reason to get fearful, this seems to match. And yet, he is asking a question. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You see, giving way to fear is taking God out of the equation. Who is in the boat? Who's in the boat with them? Uh, the Savior of the world? That's no small thing. And as a result, when you remove that factor and you make him a mere man, all you have is a mere man in the boat? Well, now fear makes sense. But if you have God Almighty in that boat with you, fear makes no sense. So what else do we know? The Savior of the world was in the boat with them. Jesus had and has authority over the winds and the waves. There is no reason to fear even in the midst of the greatest jeopardy. So this is what we know, and this is proven through the story. It is inferred through the story that Jesus is correcting them and rebuking them for two things, giving way to fear and not having faith. You see, you have launched out into the deep. That's sort of what we do when we say yes to Jesus. We enter into dangerous territory immediately. We're, we're in, a, in a hostile zone the moment we say yes to Jesus. We enter into covenant with the king of kings. Remember what they did to him? They crucified him. And now we're uniting with him saying, I'm with you in this, Jesus. And then we're shocked when winds come and waves come and our boat starts to fill up with water. It's like, no, I signed up for a version of Christianity which was placid and calm and never had any water in the boat. Which version of Christianity is that? <laughs> That actually doesn't biblically exist. You see, I know that we live in an American culture that has sponsored such a version of Christianity. Best-selling books declare such Christianity, but that sort of Christianity isn't biblical. That sort of Christianity is actually not what we signed up for. We signed up for the real thing. And that includes winds, waves, and boats filling up with water. However, he says, and I'll be there with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you till the end of the age. I I'm with you guys. I'm here with you in the boat. But right now you appear to be sleeping. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the way it feels for many of us. God, we've been praying for a long time. I mean, like a lot of prayer. We've sort of been like that persistent widow and that one neighbor that keeps knocking, 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 knocking. You tell us to do that, but we haven't seen the results of that that match what you say you're going to do. So should we stop or should we continue to believe? You see, faith only makes sense for situations like this. This is what it's groomed for. The reason God has established faith in you is for this boat circumstance you're in. So that you can draw on the truth of Scripture and stand tall and strong in this very hour. So what else do we know? This was a perfect situation to demonstrate faith. This is what faith is for. Faith is for this moment, right now. Are you a believer? If you are, what does God say? Who is he? 
Has he altered from who he is? He's a savior. That's who he is. He is able to save, desirous to save. His mercy triumphs over judgment, always. So as a result, when we humble ourselves, we pray and seek his face, we turn from our wickedness, God does his part. And the individual life and the corporate life. Our job is to believe. So it's like, what, what do you have to do today? What's your job in changing the course of history right now, which seems to be hanging in the balance? Believe, stand strong, rejoice, and be confident in your God. He is God. So, can do nos. This is the word for jeopardy, peril, danger. This is what they were in. They were in kendunos. So extreme jeopardy, danger, and peril would be the simple definition. So when God's people cross the kendunos, most of us are not familiar with the kendunos. If there was a little baby version of kendunos, many, some of us in here could raise our hands and say, yeah, I've been there. I've been to the baby version in, in Southern California where, where we would oftentimes go. Uh, they had the ocean and they had the beach on the ocean. Then they had something called a baby beach. And it was a little, little inlet, you know, where the, the crashing waves wouldn't come. So it just sort of lapped against the seashore. So, you know, our little kids at each, each of their individual uh, rotations had their little diaper swimsuit bum bum. And they would go into the baby beach and splash around. Yeah, it's sort of like what we've had. We're in the ocean, don't get me wrong, but it's like the baby can do nos. We have not understood the papa can do nos with the big crashing waves, the big power stuff that the ocean demonstrates that will literally crush you. If you try and mess with those waves, you'll realize they're more powerful than you. And so we understand the little lapping of the baby beach in our little diaper. That's sort of the American church, don't you think? And I'm I'm not hesitant to even say that's us in here. I, I'm not ashamed to say it, that we have not grown up with extreme difficulty in our life. Many of us know difficulty, but I'm talking about extreme difficulty, where if you say something, you're in prison. If you say something, your family is in prison. If you say something, you can no longer buy and sell. I mean, these, are, these are things a little bit bigger than what we've known, right? And yet, this is what the historic church has lived with throughout the last 2,000 years. And it's kundunos. So how do we, as the church of Jesus Christ, walk through kundunos? Not the little baby kundunos, because I could teach you about that. That's, that's what I've spent my life learning how to walk through is baby kundunos. The same truths that help you walk through baby kundunos are the same truths that help you walk through the papa version. And yet, it's the same thing. It's just grace. And if you were to query the saints of God in that great cloud of witness throughout the ages, and you were to put a mic to their mouth and say, so, was God faithful? Was God present with you? Did God leave you in that moment? No, not once. See, what the testimony of the ages is, is matches with Scripture. God is faithful and true. He will fulfill his end of the deal. Our job is to believe. We're just not used to grandpappy can do nos. So how are we supposed to respond? According to these three stories, there was something that Jesus noted in the disciples, and that was fear. And so what we understand through the rest of Scripture as well is that there is actually zero reason to fear because he will never leave us nor forsake us. He's right there with us. And don't you recognize that he's our refuge and our strength and a very present help in trouble? Therefore, we will not fear. You see, if you know that he's a very present help in time of trouble, he's right here. Yeah, but the boat's filling up with water. Yeah, but he's here with us. See, what's our reasoning? Think through this. Now, you know the story they didn't. They're living through the story. They've never seen Jesus with authority over winds and waves. We have. Therefore, we have something to draw from. And when our boat begins to fill up with water, we know something. He is greater than those waves. He is greater 
than that wind, and he's here with me. Therefore, I will not fear. Don't let fear touch you. I'm not saying it won't knock, but don't let it in. Remember Martin Luther's statement, you can't keep the birds from flying overhead, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. You can't keep fear from knocking. Oh, anxiety will knock. Don't get me wrong. Okay, it's a loud mouth. But you don't need to be hospitable to it. Why? Because you are taking every thought captive to the will of Christ Jesus that would dare try and bring trauma and disorder to your inner life. This territory is governed by the truth of Jesus Christ. He is your Savior. He is enthroned on high. If God is for us, who can stand against us? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. No weapon fashioned against us shall prosper. He is a calmer of winds and waves, and he is very present right now in our boat. So fearlessness. What is it? It's the result of vigorous faith. You see, when you believe in the word of God, fear can't land. It can't nest inside of you. Why? Because you believe. It's irrational to believe that all's going uh, to hell in a handbasket if you believe that you're headed to heaven. It doesn't make any sense to fear hell if you know and have a confidence you're going to heaven. That's just the basics. But the same is true in every situation in life. If you believe God is in control, you wouldn't fear. If you believe that he's a very present help in trouble, if you believe that he's your refuge and your strength, if you believe he is all that he says he is, then fear is irrational. Why would I fear that? Why would I fear that if God says he's going to help me right now? Why would I fear him not helping me? Because I believe he cannot lie, and I believe he's faithful and true. So therefore, I'm gonna rest in this thing known as faith, and fear can't land. So it's the result of vigorous faith. It's the strong belief that not only is God fully with us in our hour of trial, but he is fully in control and greater than every single threat that menaces our lives. So there's a lot right now in the American uh, scene. We have a lot that is conspiring against us. You don't need to be a conspiracy theorist to now know that there's a conspiring that's taking place. It's like, it makes all of us a conspiracy theorist if you wanna say it that way. In other words, no, it's not even a theory anymore, it's just a conspiracy fact. All right, they're playing their hand, they're in the open now, and they're very clear about their agenda. We want this band silenced. These ideas, no more. Well, Everything you just described is these ideas, is everything I believe, everything that I espouse, everything that I've ever stood for. And they want it silenced. And so we feel this. We feel this tension. These are winds, these are waves, and guess who is greater? Our God is greater than those winds and those waves. Can we rest with him? Now, what should the disciples have done? I've always processed through that. There, there probably should be a short film made uh, to show both versions of like what would have happened if the disciples responded as they ought, which I'm not exactly sure. This is just a guess of what it could have been. But could you imagine Peter? He's like, save your master. And, and Jesus lets out a sound. And then Peter has the wherewithal. It's like the spirit of God, just as he revealed that Jesus is the Christ, reveals to him what he's supposed to do in that moment. And he smirks. And the rest of the disciples are like, what are we gonna do, Peter? And Peter says, let's lay down and take a nap. In the water? Yes. You're crazy. Am I? Because, you know, I have, I've always described Jesus in this moment as sort of doing this, this type of thing. <laughs> he is in control. He's the savior of the world. And he looks at the disciples as what they're doing is totally irrational. <laughs> what are you guys doing? Why are you fearful? The only conclusion that I can come to is they should have known that he was who he is and that he is able to do all that is necessary for salvation. If he really is the Christ, if he really is the Messiah, trust him now. So here's what I am going to sponsor today. This is what I want to encourage in all of us. It's not just fearlessness, but I'm going to add an adjective to it, winsome 
fearlessness. Now, winsome is actually one of my favorite words to describe the Christian bearing. A lot of us, when we first begin to share the gospel with people, lack something. And it's not necessarily the truth. It's winsomeness. It's sort of that lighthearted friendliness where we can laugh at ourselves and laugh along with others and we have a warmth about us. It's like a cheer of soul, a glow of soul, and we cannot take that smile off our face, and we love people, we're kind to people. It's winsomeness, right? It's sort of like Pollyanna. Have you ever saw the old Disney movie Pollyanna? Winsome, that's what it is. It's a warmth, and it's attractive, right? We have something the world doesn't necessarily want, right? The truth of Jesus Christ, our message, repent. But the way in which we bring it is not with some long pointy nose and then pointy finger and, you know, we don't have to wear the camel skin loincloth either necessarily. There's supposed to be a warmth of manner that resembles heaven. It's like heaven is moved in and boom. It's giving off that warmth, that kindness, that love that led Jesus here to die for us. It's in us. Now imagine combining that with fearlessness. Imagine blending the two together and now you have something called winsome fearlessness. So let's describe it here. Crossing the dangerous kendunos with an active faith and with an active smile plastered all over your soul's face. So when is this winsome fearlessness called upon? Well, when you're in the kendunos. That's when. You see, this is in a series called The Revival of a Nation. Why? You want to revive a nation? You handle your jeopardy and your peril as a Christian. You know that all throughout Christianity, the most powerful witness for the gospel is when the church of Jesus Christ walks through the kendunos, the peril, the jeopardy, the threat towards their lives with a song, with a smile, with total fearlessness. The blood of the martyrs is a seed of the church. When we walk into the difficulty with a winsome fearlessness, it strikes dumb the opposition. They have no description for it. In fact, their souls are shaken, and many actually come to Christ. Some of the greatest stories you read through Fox's Book of Martyrs. The first uh, martyr, James, is betrayed by a man. And this man, in seeing James approach his death, is so struck by his fearlessness and his willingness to die joyfully, that he repents and dies with James. Figure that one out mathematically. That doesn't make sense. But there is a power of reviving souls when we walk through our difficulty as Christians. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. When God's people cross the dangerous kendunos, Their winsome fearlessness ushers the souls of onlookers into the kingdom of heaven. It has always been this way. The story of Chen Wensheng, and I'm going to mispronounce quite a few things in this story. I just want to prepare you ahead of time. This is a story that uh, Nate Mockler forwarded to me uh, earlier this week, and I think you're going to like it. It matches everything we're talking about in here. So this is uh, released through China Aid uh, newsletter, January 5th, 2001. On January 1st, New Year's Day, the Chinese Communist Party, also known as the CCP, uh, Yangsheng branch of Hengyang Municipal Police Department, anytime you hear me sort of say it like that, that's Chinese, that's very good Chinese, I'm sure. And Yang Municipal Police Department issued its first 2021 penalty to again detain Chen Wing Shang for 10 days for preaching the gospel. CCP authorities plan to hold preacher Chen, a Christian resident of Heng Yang, they know as a street preacher, in custody at Hunan Heng Yang Detention Center until January 10th. Oh, that's today. Despite police repeatedly arresting and detaining him with his last 10-day detention starting August 3rd, street preacher Cheng continues to proclaim the gospel on the streets of Heng Yang. Passionate about spreading the gospel, sometimes alone, at times with others, as he regularly preaches on streets throughout the busy city, he often holds a cross with the inscription, glorify the Lord, repent, trust, and be redeemed. During the pandemic, as he continues to preach the gospel, 
Street preacher Cheng distributes masks, Bibles, and gospel tracts to people on the streets. When police arrest him, he says with a smile, Jesus loves you. God bless you. I will go with you. When police officers have released him from detention, street preacher Cheng, isn't that a great name for him? Street preacher Cheng has thanked and blessed them. Although CCP authorities repeatedly warn and threaten that they will arrest and detain him again if he continues to preach on the streets of Henyang, street preacher Chen does not intend to give up holding his street evangelical events. Even if one day sentenced to prison, he is determined to still proclaim the gospel even there. I like street preacher Chen. I want what street preacher Chen has. And I'm not going to try and buffoon you and bluff you by saying I have it. I crave it. I crave something greater in me to go on this boat across this lake, across the Kenduno, with a winsome fearlessness like this. How would Chen Weng Sheng have handled that boat filling up with water? You get the feeling that he learned the lesson. Many of us haven't learned here in America. We still crave a placid, calm lake. Otherwise, we're not crossing it in the first place. You've got to be kidding. Communist, Christians in communist uh, China ha- set out in a boat in the midst of storm to cross it for Jesus Christ. Who? I mean, we wait for it to be completely calm. We look at the weather forecast for the next 10 days. It has to be clear before we're going out. What if we didn't fear the Kenduno? What if we were willing to smile at these perils, these difficulties, these dangers, and recognize that God is always faithful, and he's always present, and if I am thrown in jail, that becomes my new mission field. If I'm thrown in prison, that's my mission field. What if we were to allow God to revive us? I believe that a revival of those around us would begin to take place. The perfect situations for winsome fearlessness. When the Savior appears to be asleep. Is he? I know it may appear that God has gotten us into something and then fell asleep on us. God is very alert to our circumstances. When the Savior appears to be deaf, remember the Syrophoenician woman? She has a sick child. She needs a Savior. She needs a healer. And Jesus is ignoring her, or is he? You see, the end statement is, great is your faith. You see, he's testing us to see if it is a bona fide faith. If she's willing to give up just because Jesus is acting like he's not hearing it, that's not a genuine faith. If she believes that he is the only source of salvation, then she will not stop until he turns and heeds because he's promised to. When the Savior appears to have forgotten, Jesus says to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, this sickness will not end in death. And then he leaves town. Lazarus dies. Four days after he's dead and buried, Jesus shows up. What does that look like, guys? On paper, what does that look like? It looks like he forgot what he said. Did he? If God extends the challenge for us, it's for a greater glory. If that difficulty extends longer than seems humanly possible, and believe me, I've been in situations where I have negotiated with God saying, God, I can't imagine this going any longer. I don't know if I can actually survive it. I don't know if any of you have had that acute, sharp pain of difficulty in you where despair is knocking so intensely and roaring from outside the door. It's like, God, I can keep him at bay another day, but I don't know if I can keep this out forever. And then God seems to always bring you to that statement, my grace is sufficient for you. I know that, Lord. I know that. But if God extends it, as he did with Mary and Martha, he's healed everyone that came to him except for his friend Lazarus? I mean, out of all the people to choose his good friend, he's going to do this to? For a greater glory. And guess what? Lazarus became a testimony of God's power. We need to remember that God's ways are higher than ours and we can trust him. 
even when the circumstances get bleak, even when it goes dark and in the conduno the waves start crashing. He is faithful. And when the Savior appears to, be, to have been defeated, I don't know and I can't say from firsthand account what it would have been like to be one of the believers in Jesus' messiahship and to watch him hang silently, naked, mocked, beard ripped out, body in shreds, and see him die without doing anything. Come on. Come on, Jesus. Show it. Show that you are almighty. Show that you are God's son. Don't let this happen. I, that's exactly the way many of us feel right now. Come on, God. Don't allow this mockery of truth to take place. You are a God of justice. You are a God of righteousness. Please. God was long-suffering with each of us. Aren't you glad that someone wasn't praying when we were caught in our sin, going, God, bring justice on that life. God, bring judgment now. Praise God that he extends that season of mercy. But we crave it. We do. When the Savior appears to be dead. Now, we know the end of the story. However, if you go back in time and walk through this, could you imagine, even though he promised that on the third day he would rise again, you could just imagine the tension. He's dead. I mean, the one who raised him to new life is in the grave. He's the one that's now dead. I don't even know who to turn to. He's my hope, my salvation died. Or did he? He did. But do you recognize that God has promised? Where do you go in that can do no? Where do you go in that time of difficulty, that time of darkness? You go to his word. His body will not see destruction. He will, in fact, rise again. Do you believe Psalm 41 through 5. We'll finish with this. I waited patiently for the Lord. Can you say the same? Have you been patient for God in this season? I've waited patiently for the Lord with a full confidence, a winsome fearlessness. No, he's in control, guys. Can you assure everyone around you God's in control? It's okay. <laughs> God's seated on high. I know it looks bad, but God's in control. Just watch. He's never failed us as a church. No matter what we go through, he'll lead us cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. He'll give us wisdom for every circumstance. He'll spare us from what we need to be spared from. And he'll give us grace for everything we need to endure. <laughs> we can laugh, guys. Let's rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all things. Do you have life to give right now? Have you waited patiently for the Lord? I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Let's emphasize that line. I just want to draw it out. Remember, this is in a series about stirring a nation. How does that happen? It starts here. Not out there, it starts here. And it starts with us waiting patiently for the Lord, staying constant in our faith, holding on, saying, my God is faithful and true. God inclines his ear and lifts us out of a horrible pit, and he establishes us, and he puts a new song in our mouth. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. There is a pressure in a time like this, and it's always been whenever the church, if you study movements of persecution in time past, what you'll see is that there will be betrayals. People that are strong in the church will suddenly side with the party that hates God. Why would they do that? Because they are more concerned about their comforts and ease in their life than they are about truth. And it's proven in a time of trial, in a time of separating wheat from chaff. And as a result, we need to recognize that the great 
secret of the Christian is their faith. That we know God is going to supply even if everyone forsakes, we hold on. Blessed is the man, I'm going to read this over, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. What's more than can be numbered? His thoughts towards us. And you were saying he'd forgotten us. And you were saying he was asleep in the boat. Promise, his thoughts towards us are more than can be numbered. God knows what's going on. He is not ignorant of the circumstances. And he is not ignorant of your individual circumstances, your family circumstances, our church's circumstances, WCF's circumstances, the churches in Windsor, the churches in Colorado, the churches across this country, the churches in North America, the churches in North and South America, the churches in all the continents of this earth. He is not ignorant of the movements of governments, the sly conversations in secret that are conspiring to overthrow truth. He is not ignorant. He is not deaf. He is a God who sees. Do you trust that he is in control? Prove it by putting a smile in your soul right now. Command your soul to smile. Command all fear out. You are a believer and you can rest confident in the midst of a boat filling up with water. My God is in control. And even if I were to die today as a martyr, my facial expression still should be winsome fearlessness. Why should my facial expression change just because I'm going to pass out of this life into the eternal version of it? As far as I'm concerned, we should have a bigger smile on our face at that moment. Oh, this is great. Have you ever heard of a, a story of a martyr that was about to die and then got spared? Nothing worse than a guy who is prepared and is so excited to go to heaven to greet Jesus and then suddenly has to keep living down here. <laughs> Do we see what is before us? There's a great end to this story. We just happen to be in one of the challenging chapters, but that's what makes the story good. I don't know if I said this to you guys last week or if I said it somewhere else. Every good story, and Hollywood knows this, the protagonist or the hero has to come into difficulty. Then that difficulty has to amplify to extreme difficulty. Then the extreme difficulty has to reach impossibility. You cannot rescue the guy until it has reached impossibility. Otherwise, it's a stinky story. No one wants to watch a story. That, oh, well, yeah, anyone could get out of that. It's like they tie his arms, but the ropes are loose, and all he has to do is slip them out. That's ridiculous. You need to make it impossible for your hero. Isn't that funny? That's the storyline. That's God's storyline. They borrowed that, or stole it, from God Almighty. He loves to bring things to the difficult, or not just the difficult, the impossible, so that he gets the credit. Uh, you have 32,000 soldiers, Gideon? No, no. Let's trim those off. God, they have like 225,000. Yeah, you have too many. Uh, 10,000, still too many. Too many? What? 300, yeah, that's about right. God delights in bringing us to the impossible so that he can shine forth his strength in such an hour. Father, thank you for bringing us to the impossible, at least to the extreme difficult. Lord Jesus, we want to cherish this place. We want to praise you in this place. We want to rejoice in your ways, in your triumph. You are able, you are desirous to save. Here we are, Lord Jesus, your church. Start here. Equip us with your grace, with a clear understanding of your saving power. And Lord Jesus, may it ebb forth out of us onto this world around us and may many be saved. We don't want to stare at coming persecution. We want to stare at coming harvest because that's what you're staring at. Turn our gaze where your gaze is turning. Lord, we love you and trust you. It's in the precious name we pray. Amen.